Mending the Arc of Human Potential at Work, led by Adam Freed. Thank you, Deborah. Wow. That was an amazing, it's hard to lead a panel after that conversation, isn't it? Uh, can my panelists join me? Or I'll do this by myself. It'll be really awkward. <laughs> Georgine, Rob, you're in. Great. So uh, we, we've been having this great conversation today about, I mean, this was the, the, the loftiest, I think, of all of them, is how do we really lift people out of incredible poverty? And we're going to go to a very pragmatic place uh, and talk a lot about things that are happening. Oh, good. I'm going to come closer. Uh, and talk about things that are happening at the level of the enterprise today. So these are four entrepreneurs who are involved in businesses that are changing the shape of work and workplaces. We're going to talk a little bit about the work that they're doing, and we encourage you to join in the conversation. Before I introduce the panelists, let me just ask, how many people in the room are currently leading an organization or involved in the leading of an organization? How many of you find it incredibly easy to attract and retain great talent at all times? Okay, fantastic, Alan. You're gonna. You're the only. Guy. People will have tips from you later. Um, so we we we're gonna have a conversation about some of the things that are happening in that space. And let me introduce my panelists first. I'm Adam Freed. I'm the chair of the board of Teachers Pay Teachers. We are the largest marketplace for online uh, online marketplace for teachers to get great materials. So 70% of American teachers come to us every year to get materials created by other teachers, and more than 100,000 teachers a year have some form of either full-time or, or, or you know, part-time employment on our platform, creating materials and sharing them. So that's a bit about my background. Let me ask my panelists to introduce themselves. Georgine Wong, who is the CEO and founder of Fairy God Boss, uh, which is the largest con community for, career community for women in the world today. Yes, um, we are four years old, based in New York City, and our mission is to improve the workplace for women. We do that through this community of women who share job reviews anonymously for women by women. They, women come to our site to learn what other experiences women have at their employers, and also just to get advice from each other. So our name is Fairy God Boss, it's a bit whimsical, but it implies that women are helping each other on our platform. We have uh, three million monthly women unique visitors on the site, and we service um, about over 100 corporate customers. Our business model is entirely enterprise, subscription, so we sell to the HR departments of large companies like Salesforce, General Motors, Johnson Johnson, who are trying to recruit and attract female talent to their workplaces. Rachel Carlson is the CEO of Guild Education Network and a, a co-founder there as well, and uh, you're doing incredible work to bring education into enterprise. Thank you. Um, hi, Rachel Carlson, as mentioned. Um, at Guild, we work with large, mostly Fortune 1000 and like-size companies who want to help offer education to their frontline employees. Uh, they do that because they see a retention benefit, a recruitment benefit, and more frequently, a important uh, symbol to the company, as well as actual upskilling initiative amidst future of work and automation that is coming down the pike for many of our clients in the retail, food service, fast casual, hospitality, and call center environments. Um, and we do our work, we work directly with the enterprise. We administer all of the education benefit on behalf of the companies through our software platform. And then we also work with a network of universities and learning providers who offer the content and help our students have a number of options for figuring out how they go back to school. And um, we're excited to be growing quickly and uh, seeing it play an important role in the future of work conversation. Irian Moon, who's uh, leading a company called uh uh, is your mic working? Uh -uh. Oh, good. Okay, great. Uh, who's leading a great uh, platform to make interviewing and scheduling of interviews more effective. And if you're recruiting a lot, you know this is a huge pain point in enterprise. Yeah. Um, Irian, uh, CEO and co-founder of Good Time. We are a relatively young company. We've been in business for two and a half years, based in San Francisco. Um, so Good Time is interview logistics platform that brings interview effectiveness to companies. We see four pillars as really important in interview effectiveness. Selecting the right interviewers uh, for a given candidate, training those interviewers so they can actually pitch the role and the company the right way um, on behalf of the company, um, and also scheduling those complex interviews efficiently, as well as bringing metrics so that heads of talent can actually improve their process. Um, so excited to be here, um, and I would love to be uh, really excited about being part of the panel today. Great, and Rob Biederman, CEO of Catalent. You want to give the introduction to Catalent. It's the most complicated business model of them uh, up here, but incredibly helpful for companies who are trying to extend their labor force. 
For sure. So um, Rob Biederman, we're a Boston-based company with offices in uh, London, Minneapolis, San Francisco, Rochester, New York City in here. Uh, what we do is help very large companies, Shell, Pfizer, Fidelity, Anheuser-Busch, move to a more op uh, agile operating model. And the reason for them to do that is it allows them to bring a far broader range of talent into how they address opportunity. And we work primarily with Fortune 100 and Fortune 50 companies that are wrestling with some kind of underlying business disruption, either from new entrants or adjacent competitors, and potentially feels as if they don't have the full talent base they need to compete with those new, those new players, and that they also want to flexibilize some fraction of their existing W-2 workforce. So we've talked a lot about how the workforce is changing, and, and this is a story of now companies who are trying to maintain, retract, and then retain talent in a very competitive labor market today. Um, can maybe each of you talk a little bit about how your companies are helping companies achieve those goals and what you're seeing as changes in the, in the labor force today? What Fairy Godboss does is try to get women to think about companies that they didn't think about working at before and to help them make better career decisions, i.e. find companies that match the kind of flexibility or benefits that they're looking for at various stages. We tend to have a communities, our communities predominantly older millennial women who are at that point in their lives where they're thinking about starting a family or just taking their career more seriously. They're done with just trying out jobs and getting experiences. They want to be somewhere that they can stay. And they want to see role models at the top of their companies. They want to see benefits that match their career planning. And the stats for gender diversity in corporate America are terrible. There's like more women, there's more guys named John running companies in the Fortune 500 than women CEOs. All right, so, and that, that trick, that, that problem is, it goes down, it's better at the entry level, but it's, you know, it's not good. And so we're trying to help solve that problem. And this, you founded the company out of a very personal experience. Do you mind sharing that? Yeah, sure. So four years ago, I was a executive and one day my boss, the CEO, was fired. And two weeks later, I was let go. It's a typical you know, corporate restructuring. And it happened at a really bad time. I was pregnant two months, so nobody knew it but me. And that meant I was on the job market wanting to find out what a company's maternity leave policy was and whether there were women in management roles. And I just didn't feel like I could talk about these things without disadvantaging myself in the job market. And so I looked around, thought, you know, there are 73 million women in the American workforce, billions in the world. and. These women, I believe, will share this information with each other and with me. So that's really the, the founding story. And um, we've seen women are incredibly generous when it comes to paying it forward with this sort of information, either because they think that what they have to share will help attract other women to have the great experiences that they've had, or unfortunately, to deter women from joining places that are really pretty terrible places for them. And you, you, could you, Irian, share a little bit about your your experience in founding the company as well? Because you also founded it out of what you felt was a real pressing problem in a company. Yeah. Um, so, I um, so what before it, we actually started Good Time, what I did was um, I had this inkling that interviews were extremely ineffective. A lot of times the the feedback you get from interviewers after interview, hey, how was the interview? And then they usually like, oh, I liked him. There's really no reason or rhyme to uh, why you're liking candidates, you know, what kind of criteria you're evaluating your candidates on, um, and that was kind of mind-boggling. So what I did when we started Good Time was I actually wanted to feel that pain uh, of recruiting teams and also what it's like to work with interviewers. So I actually worked as a recruiting coordinator at this company called MuleSoft, which became one of our customers, um, and really felt that pain myself, which at that time uh, when I started working as a recruiting coordinator, I realized that I was a horrible recruiting coordinator. I made some really, really dumb mistakes. Uh, but the benefit of that actually is a lot of those uh, human mistakes that I made uh, became part of good time. Um, and I actually kept doing that. So I worked as a recruiting operations team member at Airbnb. Uh, and then now I'm actually working as uh, a part-time recruiter at Dropbox. I don't get paid. I'm not really good at uh, doing those work, but that really gives me what it's like to be one of our customers and sitting alongside them instead of just watching over them um, and like shadowing what their work looks like. Actually doing the work gives me a really deeper understanding of what the problem really is. So 
Uh, that's kind of my founding story, and it's a continuing founding story. And Rachel, tell us a little bit about how Guild got started and, and what problem it's solving. Yeah, sure. Um, so a number of us at Guild had been working in the community college sector prior to starting the business. And uh, myself and my co-founder were actually both leading coaching teams, helping community college students try to advance to four-year universities. And we were watching the incredibly high dropout rate at community colleges um, and realizing that while uh, the community college had some influence over that. Uh, it was almost never related to grades. It was almost always related to workforce conflicts or some trouble balancing the other two legs of the stool of their life, which were work, family, and school. And, and meanwhile, all of the resources were centered only on helping you solve the school part. And so we were watching that and also watching the incredibly high customer acquisition costs that universities were facing and trying to attract talent uh, to come to their school. And so we realized we could do two things by partnering with enterprises. One, we could dramatically bring down customer acquisition costs for universities, and we've now proven that out and, and brought it down to magnitudes of order smaller than what most universities are paying. And then two, we realized that by engaging the employer and working with the students and understanding what was going on in their work life, we could dramatically improve their uh, retention outcomes, their success outcomes, and the universities could in fact pay us to do that because we had brought their customer acquisition costs down to near zero. So that was the core premise of what we were doing. And then along the way, we found out that enterprises also wanted us to administer all the education benefit for them. So we've sort of started as the network and become a uh, software platform uh, by learning from our clients. And Rob, you're interestingly sort of as, as, as these three are helping to sort of deepen relationships with full-time employees, you're also helping companies get access to a flexible workforce. Is, so to first talk a little bit about that and then I have some questions. Uh, sure, of course. So we, in 2013, when we started the business, we were at Harvard Business School and we, we thought uh, it is kind of crazy that the dominant and at that point wildly pervasive work paradigm, even so today, was the idea of a full-time job, which has a lot of challenges associated with it, particularly if it requires you to be there every single day um, from nine to five or more. Uh, it requires you to probably live in the place that you work. And uh, it really restricts your ability to contribute to the enterprise, particularly in a world where the enterprise uh, has no idea what six months or nine months or 12 months down the road it's gonna look like. And so we, we really reimagined the relationship between employers and their employees to the point where now a lot of the customers with whom we work have structured all of the most important things they need to get done over the course of a business year as a series of projects and work streams and initiatives, and not at all as a series of jobs. And that has a couple effects. One, it allows them to allow employees to feel a much greater degree of connection and purpose with the enterprise. So whatever you're working on, you know exactly how that rolls up the chain, largely, um, repurposed from the concept of OKRs. And the other thing, and we think this is even more important, is it allows you to bring a much greater uh, diversity of individuals into your workforce. So not just folks who want to live in, in Arkansas or live in Oklahoma City and be there uh, five days a week, 52 weeks a year, but people who f are from all over the world or all over the country and potentially can only participate in a very different uh, work format or work paradigm, either for lifestyle reasons or actually for psychological reasons. So, so there's an interesting, an interesting sort of, I think there are two trends that we, we are seeing happening, which is enterprises are simultaneously, I think, picking their most valuable employees and saying, how can we double down on these employees? And then also saying, how can we not engage with people who are not going to think or, or may, may not be as valuable to us? Is that a trend you're seeing? Am I, am I right? Am I wrong? Who wants to jump in? I guess I can engage on the, the non-engaged non comment a little bit. Um, so I think something we're seeing that's really interesting is a lot of the companies we work with, so think Walmart, Disney, Lowe's, Chipotle, Taco Bell, you can catch a theme. These are hourly wage jobs. Many of them have a very clear business roadmap of what their labor forces are going to look like one, two, three, and five years from now. And no surprise to anyone in this room, they're smaller than they are today. Um, but meanwhile, we're in an incredibly tight labor market. So there's sort of this um, runaway train that's going to run into a brick wall, right? So everybody's recruiting, 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 and they all understand that it's going to basically fall off a cliff at some point here. And so what some really thoughtful companies are doing is thinking about how's that going to impact our brand equity? How's that going to impact how our consumers think about us? Um, Walmart, I think 84% of America shops at Walmart, but 10% of households work at Walmart in the US, right? So 10% of their customer base buys there. Um, so they think about this stuff. So uh, Lowe's is my favorite example who's thinking about this in a savvy way. They know they don't need as many cashiers a couple years from now as they have. 
So what we're doing with Lowe's is helping their cashiers become appliance repair trades men and women, plumbers, electricians, et cetera, um, through actually Penn Foster, which Frank's here today. Um, and so they've designed a great program. And the reason that sounds entirely benevolent, right? It's going to serve Lowe's phenomenally well. It actually also serves their double bottom line because they are um, looking all the time to create more tradespeople to help implement the things that get purchased at a Lowe's. And in fact, they actually have a business line oriented to it and uh, it's their fastest growing business line. So I think that's some of what we're going to see in the future here that's going to happen pretty quickly. And that's how from the frontline worker perspective. And Rob, are you seeing a similar trend where, where companies are using you to try and reduce the number of, you're also dealing with very large enterprises. Yeah, I, I, it's actually quite the opposite, that they're using us, or the people in our network, to fill roles that they have had open for six months, for nine months, for 12 months, and they just can't find the right match in a full-time role. So they have a new skill set, let's take the example of a um, Midwestern cereal manufacturer. For a hundred and some odd years, they've had to manufacture, uh, market, and distribute cereal. And starting maybe three or four years ago, the basis of competition in their industry totally changed from how well do you market cereal to how digitally do you link up with Walmart and Target and Kroger? Or how well do you understand your customer base and what they're looking at from you three years down the road? And that led to a bunch of new skill sets that had never been important at this company. And so for 100 years, they've had fantastic manufacturing, marketing, and distribution. And not one person there is a Instagram sentiment analyst or is a digital supply chain um, person. And those people may not actually want to work at this at the cereal company, or they may not live in the um, the place that that, that company is located. And so they're able to now to tap into a totally different employee base. A common objection we get in our first meeting with customers is, these are the most important things we have to do this year. Why in the world would we outsource them? To which we have two responses that may sometimes come off as a little glib. Um, the first is, if you're using Bain and McKinsey and BCG, you are already outsourcing the most important things you need to do. So. Sorry to shatter your illusions there. <laughs> but then more importantly, you should think about what we're doing is insourcing talent, not outsourcing problems and solutions. And I think companies are, are at this point, have almost no choice but to consider alternative labor sources uh, because of a very tight labor market and also a um, population that doesn't necessarily have the skills in the right place to take on those challenges. So Georgine, you, you started out you, uh, helping women find great information about companies and then companies started coming to you and saying, can we subscribe to be on this platform? What, what is the benefit that those companies are coming to get? They're looking to also protect their brand and you know, sort of showcase the millions of dollars they've already invested, sometimes unsuccessfully, in gender diversity initiatives. They want to tell a story about why they're a great place for women to work. And a lot of them are not very good at doing that, or they don't do it to the right audiences. And essentially, we are the audience. And, and we're also an audience that tends to be on the right side of this transformation in the labor market. So the women on our site, the first adopters were female engineers because well, they're online all day. I mean, we also have Starbucks baristas leaving reviews of what it's like to work at Starbucks, but female engineers are sitting in front of their computers, are feeling comfortable with um, saying stuff online, and they're isolated in their teams. So when you have the right kind of, you know, Instagram sentiment analysis <laughs> person, and she happens to be female, or we have customers like Macy's, they're not looking for retail workers when they partner with us to become a customer. They're looking for um, product managers, UX, UI designers, the people that they know their workforce is going to transition to be looking more like, and they're very thoughtful about planning for the diversity of that future workforce. And Arian, tell us a little bit about the dynamic you're seeing about uh, companies are obviously trying to save, save time, but they're trying to hire the right people. How is that happening? Yeah, so um, because the, the job market is so tight, and I can kind of uh, feel that myself because I'm uh, involved in most of the recruiting effort at Good Time as well, um, what we are seeing is um, employers not only look at hard skills that the candidates possess, but also because the role itself will evolve so quickly with the technology advances um, and just the environment changing so quickly, the role, the requirements that uh, make the, the person successful in that role may change in the future. So we see the interview because uh, we, what we do is everything to do with the interviews. We see kind of the interview structure changing. Um, instead of focusing so hard on um, a lot on hard skills, but 
uh, we see a lot of employers focusing a lot more on uh, the potential of the employees, potential of the new hires, and whether they're adaptable to changing environment and also soft skills um, uh, that might not have might have been overlooked in the past. Uh, but those are the soft uh, the soft skills um, that will actually make them successful even within kind of changing environment. So the interview process and the structure and questions that are involved in the interview process are changing to uh, spot people with more potential instead of just hard skills. That's the trend that I see. Uh, can you just, we've talked a lot about the importance, I mean, in a number of panels, the importance of these soft skills and how the ability to collaborate locally and globally is incredibly important. Sort of how are companies actually looking for that? What signals are you mining there? Yeah, so um, a lot of times companies have a hard time finding that perfect person with all the right skills. So what they do is amongst the interview, uh, people who are involved in the inter interview process, um, they kind of agree upon the um, the qualifications that, hey, even if the candidates do not meet every single requir requirement that we have on the job board, um, if they miss, if they have a few missing skills, can they actually learn? Are they willing to learn? Um, and also, um, are they adaptable? And can, can they actually demonstrate that during the interview process? Those are some of the questions that we see pop up more and more often than just focusing um, solely on the hard skills. And you know, R Rob, the, the dream of a freelance marketplace with highly qualified people is always amazing sounding, but I panic at the thought of how I'm going to get an outsourced person to be productive if I bring them into my company. So what are you doing to help make those matches work? Sure. So I think what we found is uh, a lot of folks' general conceptions about the freelance marketplace, the 1099 economy, are, are potentially actually quite true for the 1099 economy writ large. We operate in a very narrow slice of that, which is data scientists and supply chain engineers, people who have uh, very rarefied skill sets that are very important and, and highly valued by companies. The keystone of our business model uh, is an algorithmic-based matching process where when a client posts a project, they, they, the system takes the words in that project post, compares it to all the projects we've ever done, uh, and uses data from uh, uh, another company here, Burning Glass, um, to understand really what, what is the ideal composite profile of somebody who would do a good job on this project. No um, room for human judgment, no room for uh, do I like them, how tall are they, but have they done these things, sorts of things before. Generates a candidate list, and then there's a fairly extensive interview and onboarding um, process even for a two-week project, which really ascertains have they done this specific role before and are they highly likely to succeed, all based on data. At the end of that, there are ratings and reviews that are more sophisticated than the Uber system, but follow kind of the general same paradigm. I think we've seen that that takes a lot of the um, subjectivity out of evaluating performance. And because it happens in real time, uh, candidates or, or folks who've done projects get much more uh, relevant contextual feedback than you typically get in the process of a uh, biannual or, or annual review process. What does that mean? Give an example of what that, tell me a story of what that looks like. Sure, so I, I mean a, a very important story from our platform is there was a, uh, a woman named Marissa who lives in Austin, Texas, had worked uh, at a large company there her, a lot of her career, and it had found that there was kind of a mislink between the content of her reviews and her professional advancement. And so generally people said she did a good job, but then she kept noticing that she was passed over for promotions and other stretch opportunities. She left the company um, and joined our platform and very quickly became one of the top few people out of 60,000. Became so hotly desired that uh, several senior officers at GE basically blocked out all of her time. They just put her on a retainer and said she's not allowed to bid anything else because we just want to make sure she's available. And it was such a different experience for her emotionally and, and psychologically where she'd basically given up on corporate America in some, to, to some extent because she felt like the system wasn't fair, that she did great work, but there was really very little tie between that uh, and, and how she was rewarded. Our platform functions as much more of a meritocracy. There are no pay bans. There are no um, tenure-based promotions. If you do great work for good companies, you can make... 800,000, $1.2 million a year, which is what our top earners make. And if you do bad work, then you probably will not win another project again. And so it's a, it's a platform that is not for everybody, um, but for people who have 
very specific skill sets that are highly valued by companies, it can be a great way to separate from the herd. So you, 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 you've touched on something that I think we also hear about a lot, which is that our traditional systems, both sort of social systems that sort of make us form impressions of who's going to do a good job at something, as well as the educational system, sets us up with a bunch of preconceived ideas, which may not actually relate to the true competency of the person. And I wonder, Georgine, if that's part of what you're trying to do is is help women who I think, I think there's enough data that would say they, they don't self-promote as often in the same ways and sometimes are not noticed in the ways that they might be in the workplace, if that's part of your mission. Yeah, that woman should have left a job review on Gray God bless. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of academic and social science research that shows that women need to approach negotiations differently. Their political networks at companies, which are usually related to their ability be, to be promoted, uh, their perceptions of leadership qualities, all of these things impact their progression. And, and when women in, in our community say they're not treated, we ask every woman who leaves a job review on the side, do you think you're treated equally to men at your company? And if they say no, um, usually the issue is an evaluation as opposed to recruiting. It's usually evaluation and sort of promotion issues that come up. So women don't feel that they're advancing equally on a fair basis and level playing field to, to men at their companies. How do you signal back to a company if you're starting to see data coming back from a company? I mean, they can read the reviews, but then do you offer them a chance to sort of engage more productively? Because yes. diversity and inclusion are very different concepts and have to be approached really differently. We've always been very data-centric about everything we've done because we want to show the correlations between higher ratings by women who and their employers and the employers who have better benefits, practices, and policies. And so correlation is not the same thing as causation, but we have companies who are customers ask us to benchmark them against their competitors, against their industry, and against sort of top performers. And there's lots of really interesting data that show, I mean, a lot of it's very intuitive. Longer paid leave correlates to higher job satisfaction. Perceptions of gender equality correlate to higher job satisfaction. So. It's proof, if you will, that investing in these areas will help you retain and engage your existing employee base, not just recruit new women. Rachel, you talked a little bit about how the brand, companies come to you to both improve their brand and upskill their workforce. Um, how, how much of your focus, you've talked about the alignment in your, in your system as being really getting people to graduation. Do you, do you, can you talk a little bit, bit about that and then how do you handhold them or do you handhold them beyond graduation? into yeah. the next phase of their workforce? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we're fairly young, so candidly, we haven't had enough years to see many years post-graduation, um, but we are seeing it in our shorter-term programs because we offer everything from high school completion, uh, e English as a second language, all the way through to master's degrees, so we're seeing more on the edges, whereas the bachelor's degree, we need a few more years of data um, to speak authoritatively about it. But um, what I think has been really interesting is to see how employers are thinking about this, um, their frontline workforce as a talent, pipeline uh, let's be really frank about it they're not expecting anywhere near 100 percent of their employees to use a benefit like ours in fact five percent is is pretty high um but when they do that effectively they dramatically increase their talent pipeline for frontline managers which is actually one of the toughest roles to fill in the u.s right now but it's also one of the best roles to talk about to a low-income learner and i i think we at guild get fairly sick of the teach the cashier teach the truck driver to code anthem um while we're thrilled when a truck driver or cashier chooses that pathway. When you look at the core competencies they've developed on the job, that's normally not particularly aligned with the co core competencies of another middle wage job. But what are our people managers? A lot of our folks who are really, really great at working in a cashier restaurant role make great people managers. A lot of our truck drivers make really great technicians and are going to probably um, work on servicing the robots that might replace them, right, in the driving of the work, but they will take care of the machinery. And so what we're thinking about all the time is how do you actually align those competencies so that we don't have to sit and read the articles that I feel like have come out in the last week post Davos of there really aren't going to be any jobs for the 64 million Americans who didn't go to college and make an hourly wage today. And that's more than a third of America's workforce. So we're in a tough spot if that anthem is true, but we believe and are seeing lots of evidence that it doesn't have to be the case. So all of your companies require enterprises and probably the HR department or maybe it's the strategy department, in your case, Rob, to engage with you. And we know it's a really tight labor market right now, so sub 4% unemployment. Is this, is, this a, is this a dynamic that changes if, the, if unemployment goes up, if we see unemployment go up, uh, you know, 
more significantly is our comp HR department's going to say, look, that was a lovely idea. And when we were really hustling and needed to have great blog posts, we went to you, but now it's not worth our, our time or our money. Or is the value deeper? I can start and then you guys can jump in. Um, I... Uh, I think it's at two levels. I think at a very surface level, consumer facing companies are going to have to be very careful in an era of automation because I think the American public is going to choose the way right now there's an American made movement. I think there's going to be a human made movement or a human sold movement. And you're going to buy things from companies that employ Americans versus employ robots. And so I think um, there are companies already thinking about that, and we hear that from our consumer-facing companies all the time. Um, and then I think at a, a one level deeper, I think there will still be a large need for many people to work. I think we have a lot of lack a lot of clarity about what that's going to look like, and we're all trying to figure it out. Um, and I think our companies recognize that as well. But I think it really is a two-pronged problem for frontline workers again. And then you guys can speak about elite workforce. What I would say is I think we're, our company is in, in the process of surfing a 25 or 30 year secular wave of companies reimagining how they resource. And so we are, we do happen to be in a tight labor market. If you look at a lot of the statistics around who we're graduating and what jobs they're capable of doing and what companies, what skill sets companies are need going, going to need going forward, regardless of whether we're in a tight or loose labor market, there is going to be a massive disparity in the skill sets uh, that, that we're producing with our education system or our immigration system versus the skill sets that companies need. And so I think I, I feel pretty strongly that a local only or a local dominant labor market uh, will hopefully continue receding and receding and receding and then one day ideally disappear. Um, and that that's, that is far bigger than the difference between 3.8 and 5.4% you know, unemployment. By the way, it, it can be difficult as a um, moderator uh, to talk at all about your company, and Adam does have a fantastic um, company. I'll pay the five bucks later for that. Question, uh, <laughs> question back at you. To tell us how you, you think about people um, reimagining their own careers on your site. Well, in in our site, it's obviously it's a different it's a different situation because teachers start out by really looking to build community and 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 share their research their great resources with other teachers, and then they find that they get approbation from other teachers and actually money on top of it. And so there's a really, there's there are more than 100,000 teachers who make money on our platform. For some of them, it is absolutely a business, and they are incredible mini publishers in their own right. And for many of them, it is a chance to be engaged in the economy and engaged in community. Um, and, and what I, I was gonna actually ask as sort of in, along those lines are, the relationship between employer, whether that's uh, a traditional employer or sort of a freelance worker, the relationship between an employer and an employee seems to be shifting from one which was a hierarchical relationship to one which feels like a conversation that can sometimes be uncomfortable. How do you think you're playing into that conversation? You know, I can imagine, Georgine, you have a lot of power, right? If, if you can say to, employers can either work with you or can get bad reviews and then really lose a lot of great workers that they want to get to. How do you see that conversation evolving? Recently, there's been some controversial ads, uh, like the Gillette ad about what it means to be a man and toxic ma masculinity, and then the Colin, the Nike ad. You know, I think companies are being forced to the lines between a consumer and employee are basically gone. They're 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 going away because every woman who's on our site and is an employee is also making household purchasing decisions, and she's going to care whether Uber is a good place to work and whether there's yeah, like those disastrous headlines, like women I know stop using Uber. It's as simple as that. And the same is going to be true of any place. I mean, and that's you know part of how I think we accomplish our social mission is to, it's not naming and shaming, it's public peer pressure to improve. We all have to rise to a higher standard level, and it takes if it takes competition to get you there, then that's what we're going to facilitate. Irdin, you're, you're at the front lines of this conversation between employer and employee. Mm -hmm. How do you see that relationship evolving? Yeah, I actually totally agree with you on the fact that uh, the line between consumers and, and employees or candidates are being blurred. Um, the whole big raise in recruiting is the focus and um, effort into creating better candidate experience for people who are applying for jobs um, at, at your uh, organization. Um, and 
employers care uh, not only about hiring the right people, but also creating really good experience to where they actually advocate for the brand um, and um, you know end up becoming consumers of your your brand. And uh, kind of talking about the diversity, um, how we came to realize that interview process um, and the diverse, how diversity actually plays into the interview process was that, especially in Silicon Valley, it's really hard to hire female developers, female engineers. Um, and what we, one of our customers uh, that um, used that used good time, but before they started using good time, um, they did a, a quick research on why they were not hiring enough female engineers. One thing that they found out was when these female candidates come in to the interview, uh, they are greeted by 10 male engineers. Um, and that really turns them off. And especially if you're a female engineer in Silicon Valley, you have seven or eight offers on the table. You don't need to take this job. Um, and you get some really out, uh, outrageous offers from Facebook, Google, um, and some you know, fast-growing brand names. Um, and that experience through the interview process uh, being evaluated by all-male um, interviewing team, um, that gives really, really bad taste in their mouth. And even if you are a perfect candidate for this job, you'll probably not take the offer at the end of the process. So what they found out was they had plenty of females going through the pipeline. They were not accepting the offer at the end of the process. So through uh, using our product, what they did was they, uh, it's a really simple change, but in every single interview panel, you have to have at least one female, and e female either leadership or female engineer, female interviewer, um, and they found out that their, their offer acceptance rate at the end of the process for this diversity candidate just shot up. So even something as small as that changes how candidates actually feel about your brand and also you as an employer. And I, can, I, I think candidate experience is becoming a, a, a huge differentiator for the employers that we work with. And Rachel, talk, talk to me about that relationship between, sorry, I think there is, okay. The relationship between um, the employer and the employee as well, and how is how is that evolving? Yeah, so I think some of the trends are different for the hourly workforce, but it, it, with some similar commonalities. So I think one thing is um, our students, one of the great learnings we've had at Guild is our students really look to their employer um, as a voice of authority in the way prior generations maybe thought about the government. So our students know the school needs to be accredited they don't want a for-profit school because they've often had family members who are in great debt or have had negative experiences. But beyond that, they want their employer to recommend where they go to school. Um, the the typical ethos of, hey, where the, the location is really matters even when learning online doesn't turn out to be true for our students. Um, and so that's an interesting one. And then I think the other relationship that we're seeing really shift is um, – employers are starting to think of themselves as the purchaser of higher ed or continuing education. And I, I'm sure somebody said that during the corporate learning boom, but I think there's a real shift right now happening in how they think about it all the way down to the bachelor's degree or even anything prior to that. And we're seeing employers talk to their L&D departments differently about how do we think about this the way we think about supply for the rest of our business. Great. Thanks. And Rob, you... You're obviously also at the forefront of that relationship between employer and employee. Do, do employers, do employees look at your service and say, this is great, I can get access to more talent at the senior levels, but at the more junior levels, look at this and say, this is the outsourced future and I'm in trouble? So typically the response from internal employees whose companies have added this system as a, as a work paradigm option for them is wildly positive because at, at a, at a, in a lot of roles at big companies, your biggest frustration is that you do the same thing every day and you, you don't have to go all the way to office space, the movie, but it, at some companies office space, the movie feels more like your day-to-day -day life um, than working on our platform does for sure. So employees are by and large very excited about working in a project-based way where they can tell how what they're working on um, rolls up the chain. The other big question we get is, well, aren't the aren't the employers very um, uh, short-termish and very um, mean to the freelancers who work for them? And the the um, the paradigm that we've seen is is that uh, uh, if you've had a bad experience in a dwelling, uh, landlords tend to be a lot less responsive than hotel managers. 
because in a hotel context, you can walk out the next day uh, and never stay there again, whereas a, in a landlord context, you're kind of stuck. Um, and so we actually see that uh, at almost all of our companies, the freelancers on our platforms have higher net promoter scores than the full-time employees of those companies because I think they're treated with, with, with more care. Thank you. I want to thank all of you. We have a few minutes for questions. I started out by asking if any of you were running companies, and you may have questions for these folks about your own employment force or any, any questions from the field. We left about five minutes. Were we so comprehensive? I have more questions. Well, let me ask you then. Was there? Oh, there's one. I didn't see you there. Yeah. You know Rob's story pretty well, but what was the assumption you made starting your business that turned out to be 100 percent wrong? That's a great one. Start with that. We thought our students wouldn't want a degree branded with their employer, and it turns out uh, Chipotle, for example, built a custom bachelor's degree in business with a university, but with a focus in restaurant management, and it's got Chipotle brand right on it, and it is by far the most popular program. Rob, go ahead. Uh, everything. Um, <laughs> so the, the, biggest, the biggest assumption we got wrong, and I had a great conversation with a customer about this this morning, is we thought that this would be wildly intuitive to customers and demand would just be so much that we couldn't even pick up the phone and that nobody would want to do it on the supply side and that that would be um, like pulling teeth uh, because that's what a lot of other labor marketplaces have seen. And we've experienced the complete opposite where we have never spent a dollar or a minute acquiring any of the 60,000 people on our platform. And every customer conversation is awful. Um, and it's largely because it's just such a, it's such a mindset shift for uh, a corporate leader to say, rather than hiring people and, and owning talent, we're just going to access it in real time on demand. It's just a complete frame shift. Here again. Georgine, okay. I think I I was pretty convinced that in the beginning that the problem of not having enough women would only be in the province of those who could afford to think of that as a problem. But I remember the day we signed on the Midwestern Utility Company, American Water, and all of these companies that I just didn't think were going to be, they're not like the names you see in headlines. That's when I realized that this was going to be really big, because it's not just those rich companies that can afford to care about gender diversity that cared about it. Great. Yes. Hi there. I'm Anathia, co-founder and CEO of Skillist, um, building a skill-based hiring platform. I think my question is primarily for, for Robin, for Rachel. Um, I think what you guys have built, you're both introducing entirely new ways of doing things to employers. And so adoption is really interesting, right? Like I think intuitively what you had mentioned, how do you get people to try something that's entirely different the way they've ever thought of it? Is it you know, data ROI or more of a story around this is a movement of where the world is going, here's why you should really to try this? Um, for us, it's just been a journey. So our first few clients, we had to convince them and, and prove to them the ROI to dramatically grow the budget over time. We now have clients who are at our throat saying, grow faster, grow faster, because the executives are seeing such a powerful ROI and the CEOs are talking about it in their quarterly earnings and they're seeing it day over day improve their job applicants and their retention rates. So for us, it was really early days showing an efficient ROI equation and convincing them to take a bet because you need six months to do that. Um, and then now it's it's a bigger story. So I think it's just been a journey in that direction. This is a, effectively the same response with different words. We found originally when we were telling the story about the agile workforce and all these fantastic people who wanted to work in a different way, nobody cared. You couldn't get attention from corporates. It was not on the priority roster. Nobody had the job of help our company source better talent. And HR tried and would get shut down by the business leaders. And then we repositioned uh, about a year ago as the company that is the agile operating model to help you stave off disruption and tied it exactly to the most important business priorities that you had. And, and what we're doing became a means to an end for companies. Well, obviously, we're deeply passionate about it. And we think it's an end in and of itself. But if you really want to get on the priority list at a Fortune 500 company, it's very important that come back to the most important three things that they're trying to do. We have time for one more question. All right. Well, thank you all very much for your time, and thank all of you for joining us in the panel.